Hello, my name is Toby Thompson. I'm here today with Phil Greening, Research Fellow here at Cranfield School of Management. Phil, you're looking at disruption in supply chains and networks uh, yes. of supply chains. Say some more about your research. Okay. Um, I think um, most of the sort of supply chain theory was de uh, developed from uh, understanding buyer-seller relationships. And then from that point, we went to trying to coordinate serial buyer-seller relationships. So in a line, a linear thing? Yes. And so the problem came, how do we coordinate those best? Um, and that isolated the supply chain so that we assumed that there was nothing going on around it or whatever was going on around it was steady state. Nothing was changing. Um, but there's some circumstances where actually we know the things that are happening around the supply chain will matter and they'll matter significantly. So things like disruptions in adjacent supply chains that remove capacity from the system mean that the supply network has to reorganize. So where we shared suppliers across supply chains, the disrupted supply chain will try and access the resources held somewhere else. So we're here in uh, April 2011, and yep. the, uh, the Japanese tsunami and earthquake has happened. We're seeing disruptions in the manufacturing supply chain. Say some more about how that disruption plays out. Well, so some of the uh, strategies that um, traditional supply chain theory has uh, steered us towards, such as um, reducing inventory, reducing our supplier base, increasing the strength of connections to get improved coordination, they, um, they mean that any disruption will travel faster through the supply chain. Um, and where we share suppliers, they'll, it'll travel fast into other supply chains. So there's, there, there's the example today, actually, um, and in the news of uh, Toyota and Nissan cutting back production in the UK because the disturbances of supply from Japan has now reached a point where they, they can't make the cars anymore. So is disruption always a bad thing, or is there natural disruption in a supply network anyway? That there's dis what I would call disturbance within a supply chain. You know, this, these are the sort of the everyday variations that we expect companies to adapt to. So the supplier didn't manage to get that lorry on the road at the time it was supposed to be, so it'll be a day late. And that's why we carry inventory. You know, that's, that's why the inventory is there as a buffer. So we have an expectation of those disruptions and we can describe them with statistical probabilities. So we know they're going to happen. Um, so we carry a buffer to protect us. Now, disruptions are the things we don't expect. They're sudden and unpredictable. So they could be from natural disasters, deliberate attacks on our system, or they could be uh, as a consequence of a coincidence of very small events. And this is what um, Charles Perrault describes um, as normal accident theory, which is um, if you have a complex system and very strong dependencies within that system, there is an inevitability that during the normal operation of it, it will fail. You can't stop it, you can't predict it, you just know it's going to fail. You don't know how it's going to fail. So it seems like you're, you're, you're challenging the orthodoxy of supply chain as a linear thing. You're introducing complex theory. How are you beginning to model or, or, or test this idea? A very good point, because it's um, very difficult to, A, describe a network. You know, very difficult to say, these are the participants and this is how they connect. And even if you could, it's very hard to empirically gather data from everything because everything matters. So um, the people that embrace this type of research or this philosophy, complex systems, um, increasingly are turning towards computer simulation because the advances in uh, computer power, um, but also um, uh, artificial intelligence, being able to uh, develop learning computer simulations allow us to create a virtual world. So it's not quite a flight simulator, but it's a supply chain simulator. And someone yeah. ingesting or learning about your research that you've done, how do they put that into practice and what does that manifest? How, how does that look like? Is it an aware, general awareness? Is it putting pr principles and rules into practice? We're still discovering how people will use it, in all honesty, um, but uh, there are several ways. You, you can use the simulation as um, a company, for instance, and you could use it as a wargaming environment. So you could say, well, these are the strategies that we have. Now can we see how they play out? And um, c can we start to understand 
how vulnerable these strategies make us. And if they do make us vulnerable to disruptions, then um, what are the alternatives? And what's the trade-off between the alternative and the optimal solution? You know, we're looking for a solution that is good. It can't be a bad solution. We can't, we can't lose money by being robust and uh, resilient. Um, but um, maybe the optimal solution, given there may be an inevitability of a disruption, is also quite dangerous. So we need somewhere in the middle ground, but we don't know where that is. So you can use the simulation to find where that is and understand the risk that you're taking. So I think what it does is it introduces um, a deeper understanding of risk to the supply chain manager so that they can get a really good handle on what risks they're accepting and uh, what risks they're going to mitigate. Amazing. You seem to have enlivened the whole supply chain debate with complex theory, with computer simulations. I've got this amazing image in my mind. Phil Greeny, thank you very much indeed for your time. Thank you.